Shalom, shalom. Yes, we are again in this beautiful garden of our hotel. You know, Africa is so blessed, at least Uganda. We have green all year long. Uh, the, some trees bloom, some trees have, have fruits, some trees lose their, their, their leaves. We have three seasons almost the whole year, but we don't have winter, and I don't miss winter. I had enough winter in Europe, and I even don't miss skiing. I am now sliding through life with Jesus. And today is the chapter nine in that book, Lola Gola, Let Go, Let God, the God I can rely on. In Psalm 118.8, oh, by the way, that was a Jewish believer who thought, I am going to check what is the center, the center word of God. Where are there the same amounts of scriptures a front and in the back? And he found out it is Psalm 118, verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. That's the center word of God. So please take that serious. God wants to have the most important in the middle. Jeremiah 17, 5 to 8. This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like staunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. <clears throat> they will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along the riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Then in Proverbs 3, 5-6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you, the, show you which path to take. <clears throat> you know, the word of God is, is food for our souls. The word of God we can stand on. What God promises, he, he also will do. He cannot lie. God's word is the foundation of our faith. So frequently I, I meet people who live according to maximum of God helps those who help themselves. And they are very surprised when I tell them this sentence is not in the Bible. It doesn't say help yourself, then God will help you. People who adhere to this motto are usually people who during their youth have been very disappointed by authority figures such as parents, teachers or older brothers and sisters. They trusted them and were then let down. This resulted in a root of bitterness creeping into their hearts. It was very similar with me. When I began to read the Bible, I noticed that in my heart I just gave a mocking, unbelieving smile at every promise in the Word of God. I was very surprised at myself and finally asked God to show me why I was behaving like this. He reminded me that my earthly father had sometimes made promises he didn't keep. And that had hurt me so much that as a young person I had resolved, don't take promises seriously, then it won't hurt if they don't keep them. I also applied this to the promises of God as they, uh, as they are found in the Bible. I then forgave my father for reasons that included the realization that I too had probably made promises that I had not kept. I asked God to remove the root of bitterness from my heart and to cleanse me. Since then I've been able to take the word of God and promises of God seriously. Perhaps things are similar with you as they were with me. And you are unable to trust God because you cannot accept his promises. 
Perhaps you also have a root of bitterness against God in your heart because he has allowed something you don't understand. Then ask the Lord for forgiveness for your bitterness and ask him even if you don't understand. Oh, no. And thank him even for things you don't understand. In Ephesians 5.20 we read, Always, always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18 uh, we read, We are likewise called upon to give thanks. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you to belong to Christ Jesus to live. If you begin to give thanks for everything, even for things you don't like or understand at the moment, you will see how God opens the eyes of your heart and gives you relation, a revelation so that you learn to understand through reflection and the heart of gratitude. You know, I want to share with you, I, know I, am, I am very advanced in my youth, okay? And I had many opportunities that I didn't understand. And I said, Lord, this situation, I didn't pray for it. I don't like it, and I don't understand it. But you allowed it to happen. So I say, thank you. I don't feel thank you, like thank you. I say with my words, thank you. And I say thank you until my spirit believes it. And that has helped me to get over bitterness in my heart. Otherwise, you judge God. What is he doing? Does he know what he's doing? You know, God never makes a mistake. He knows what he's doing. And he knows what is best for you and me. Amen? So I want to continue. And if you begin to give thanks for everything, give thanks, not feel thankful. You can't feel thankful if that's something you don't understand, you don't like. If you begin to give thanks with your words for everything, even for things you don't like or understand at the moment, you will see how God opens the eyes of your heart and gives you revelation so that you learn to understand through reflection and the heart of gratitude. You can, really, you can rely on God. He will never abandon you. He will never leave you in, the, in a hole. I have experienced this personally. In the last presidential elections in Uganda, one of the candidates wanted to name himself as president without waiting for the election results. Wherever he appeared and gave speeches, tear gas was sprayed, cars were set on fire, and shops plundered. The German embassy wrote to all foreigners in Uganda and recommended that we, particularly women and children, leave the country because we would otherwise be plunged into complete chaos. As Europeans, we were no longer allowed to, give, to go into the town and were to remain in our houses. We therefore sent only our native staff members shopping, and they repeatedly told us of the chaotic conditions. It could also be seen on television and in the newspapers. This caused me to remember my frightening childhood experiences from, world, from Second World War II. And I was unable to sleep at night. I felt panic. The only thought I had was how I would be able to obtain as many passports and visas as possible and take as many children as possible out of this country. During this time of deep inner unrest, the Lord asked me, Maria, who brought you to Uganda? You, Lord, I answered. His second question was, and who will bring you out of Uganda again? Ever Lexton said, you, Lord. Immediately the thought came, if I perish, I perish. These were the words that Queen Esther had in her heart. I was sure that I had reached this decision through the Holy Spirit and a deep peace entered my heart. I was transformed. A peace that passed all understanding entered my soul. I knew that I could trust God completely and rely on him 
in this difficult situation. The very next day, the presidential contender was arrested and put in prison. But I would have had peace even without his arrest, without knowing that he had been arrested. I went into the town the next day. It was a perfect liberation. These events had a very special ending. Every first Sunday of the month, or <coughs> I or one of our staff visited the prison to hold a service for the prisoners and preach the gospel. A while after the arrest of this man, I took over the prison ministry and who was sitting next to me on one of my visits, the aforementioned presidential contender. If I had not recently experienced that I can rely on God completely, and if I had not felt his peace in my heart, I would have rushed out of the prison as far as, I, as my feet could have carried me out of fear of this man. But now, I was able to sit in complete peace next to him. And I asked God in prayer, Lord, what do you want to do? Why have you put me here? The Lord said to me, speak to him. And with an honest heart, I spoke to him and told him that I admired his qualities and abilities, but that his spirit needed renewing. I also asked him what his intention for our country were. Finally, the time came for me to preach. I preached in a new, pure heart and a heart completely at God's disposal. At the end of the sermon, the man stood up with many others and wanted to receive Jesus and a pure heart into his life. The wonderful thing is that there were no more incidents and the man really did have a changed heart. All glory be to God. So, dear ones, what do we need to let go of? Where are you not rely, relying on God? Where are you on the way by yourself? In what areas do you still prefer to take things into your own hands instead of giving them over to God? Are you grateful for everything that God has done in your life? Where do you find it difficult to be grateful? <clears throat> now, I have a short prayer, but then I have quite a bit of exercise for you. The prayer is, and you can repeat it after me, Father in heaven, thank you for my life. Search my heart and show me where I still live in independence so that I can repent and give you my complete individual trust. Thank you, Father, that I can rely on you and that you will speak to me. <clears throat> now the exercise. Write down all things in your life that you have never given thanks for and begin to say thank you to God. You can confess in all honesty. Lord, I still don't understand the situation. I don't like it either, but in obedience. I thank you for it and trust you that you will bring good things out of it. Amen. But now, if you can take, make the decision to agree with the following statements, then you will find it easier to rely on God completely. I advise you now to really take these words seriously. <clears throat> First, I always say what your problem, uh, what you renounce and then what the scripture is. <clears throat> I renounce the lie that my heavenly father is far away and not interested in me. In Psalm 139, 1 to 8, I opt for the truth that my Heavenly Father is personally very much involved with me. The next lie. I renounce the lie that my Heavenly Father is unfeeling and indifferent. I opt for the truth that my Heavenly Father is kind, friendly, and full of mercy. 
that's him, Psalm 103, 8 to 14. Then the next lie. I renounce the lie. You always can say in Jesus' name that my heavenly Father is hard and demanding. In Romans 15, 17 and Zephania 3, 17, I opt for the truth that my heavenly Father is positive and full of joy and love. Next lie. I renounce the lie in Jesus' name that my heavenly Father is passive and cold. Isaiah 40, verse 11. Hosea 11, 3 to 4. And you better look up those scriptures. I opt for the truth that my heavenly Father is warm-hearted and loving. The next lie. I renounce the lie that my heavenly Father is absent and too busy for me. The truth you will find in Hebrews 13, 5. In Jeremiah 31, 20, and in Ezekiel 34, 11 to 16. I opt for the truth that my heavenly Father takes pleasure for to in me and seeks fellowship with me. Next lie. I renounce the lie that my heavenly Father is impatient or annoyed and is never satisfied with what I do. The answer is in Exodus 34, 6. And 2 Peter 3, 9. I opt for the truth that my heavenly Father is patient and slow to anger and rejoices that I am in Christ. The next lie. I renounce the lie that my heavenly Father is mean and cruel and that he just uses me. In Jeremiah 31, 3, Isaiah 42, 3, and Psalm 18, 2, we find the answer. I opt for the truth that my Heavenly Father is loving, gentle, and protective. Next lie. I renounce the lie that my Heavenly Father tries to take away all joy in life. The answer is in Lamentations 3, 22 to 23, in Jonah 1, 10, and in Romans 12, 1 to 2. I opt for the truth that my Heavenly Father is trustworthy, he wants to give me fulfill, fullness of life. His will for me is good, perfect, and acceptable. Next lie. I renounce the lie that my Heavenly Father is controlling and manipulative. <coughs> I, I now find the answer in Hebrews 4, 15 to 16, and in Luke 15, 11 to 16. I opt for the truth that my Heavenly Father is full of mercy and grace and also gives me the freedom to fail. Next one. Next lie. I renounce the lie that my Heavenly Father is condemning and vindictive. And the answer is found in Psalm 130, 1 to 4, and in Luke 15, 17 to 24. I opt for the truth that my Heavenly Father is gentle and loves to forgive. His heart and his arms are always open for me. And here is the last lie that I have found out, but uh, maybe more. I renounce the lie that my Heavenly Father nags, always finds fault, and is a perfectionist. But I find the answer in Romans 8, 28 to 29, 12, 5 to 11, on 2 Corinthians 7, 4. I opt for the truth that my Heavenly Father rejoices when I think, when He thinks of me and is proud that I am His growing child. So, if you take these things very serious and, and you ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart, you will find a God in whom you can trust. You, can find, you will find a God who is the sec most secure place in life where we can put I a whole trust in spirit, soul, and body. And I trust that you will really get settled knowing that you are extremely taken care of, extremely loved, extremely important, and that you are getting out of every feeling that you are second choice or something. And you get into a level of knowing deep in your spirit that you are loved, that you are special, that you are chosen, that you are forgiven, that you are a child of God, that you are the dream in God's heart, that you are the potential in His hand, 
that you are voice of God on this earth, that your body is the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, that not only that, but your father is the king of kings. And now you and I, we are chosen ambassadors for the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the kingdom of God. There's no higher position in this whole universe besides being God himself. But we are ambassadors. We are representatives of the King of Kings. And in the future, when somebody asks you, what's your name? You don't just give your worldly name. You say prince or prince, princess. I am Princess Mama Maria. And you are Prince John. You are Prince Robert. You are Prince Norbert. You are Prince Daniel. You are royal. And I want you to greet me in your royal dignity in your royal destiny. Amen. Bless you. Shalom, shalom.